Who are your commercialization partners? Getting from a great idea to a great business. Welcome to What's Next Canada, Canada's premier aging and brain health conference, repurposed for you in a special podcast series. Listen in with our host Mel Barsky as he introduces the business panel. The moderator is Liz Jensen, Clinical Director at Direct Supply. The panelists are Ariel Garten, Founder and Chief Evangelism Officer at IntraExxon. Mara Leff, Director of Innovation at the Jewish Healthcare Foundation. And Jay Lefton, Partner at Baskin. Here we go. Now streaming, listen in to this business panel. Who are your commercialization partners? Getting from a great idea to a great business. Our next panel, which is called Who Are Your Commercialization Partners? Getting from a Great Idea to a Great Business. It takes a village to get an innovation to market, navigating the complexity of intellectual property uh, protection, supply chain, and frontline implementation puts innovators outside their comfort zone and areas of expertise. In this panel, we're going to talk about uh, have a group of experts lined up. Um, that have expertise in what you need to do to go from a great idea to a great business. I'm going to introduce our moderator, Liz Jensen, who's the clinical director of Direct Supply. Um, Liz, uh, this company is uh, based out of Milwaukee, but is a huge national organization. And I'll let Liz talk about Direct Supply because uh, the name doesn't uh, give justice to all the things that this organization does. But Liz herself works with senior care providers, product managers, and engineers to translate evidence-based research, regulations, and risk management strategies into practical processes, technology, and applications for clinicians and frontline care providers in senior care. Liz leads the Direct Supply Spark Collective uh, Clinical, an interprofessional collaboration of seniors care nurses, therapists, physicians, pharmacists, and others who test and pilot innovative technology products and services that seek to improve outcomes for seniors and elevate quality and efficiency of care delivery to a new level. Uh, Liz currently serves as the co-chair of the Innovation Platform Advisory Council for AMDA, the Society of Post-Acute and Long-Term Care, and is a member of the AHCA Clinical Practice Committee, serves on the Argentum Quality Standards Committee, and is a frequent speaker at global conferences. That's all the time we have today, so we're going to have to... Oh, sorry. Uh, Liz, may I turn it over to you and thank you so much for, uh, for leading this panel with us today and I'll let you introduce our other great panelists. Sounds good, Mel. Thank you so much. I, I, I should have sent the, the abbreviated version for you, so I apologize uh, to all that had to sit and listen to all of that. Um, I'm, <laughs> um, I'm thrilled to be here today and as Mel said, I'm the clinical director at Direct Supply. Um, we're located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and our, um, but we serve, um, we, we estimate that we probably serve on some level, either by selling them products or services uh, to uh, 90 to 95% of all of the skilled nursing and assisted living communities uh, in the United States today. And, um, and as everyone, I'm sure, and we've talked a little bit about this morning, can imagine um, the focus for those groups right now is really around um, preventing and, and containing the spread of the coronavirus. And so it's been a lot of activity um, around that and certainly um, demonstrates, I think, the, the, the uh, community and the willingness to help um, band together and work together to, um, to help in, in times of need. And, and I, I was reflecting on that this morning as I was thinking about this particular um, session today and, the, and um, this panel that we've assembled for you today. Um, we really, um, I think the idea of um, getting a great idea um, uh, to a great business and really the, the pathway for innovation is one that's um, certainly a, a challenging one for sure. And it does take a, a lot of people to, um, to see um, a new idea or a great idea um, come to fruition. Um, being a nurse for um, almost 30 years, I've um, certainly seen my fair share of um, innovative products um, and the impact that those can have in changing the way that we provide care and services to older adults. So um, 
just um, I think that our focus on trying to continue to collate, create collaborative opportunities, such as the, um, the work that Cabby's doing to bring um, folks together to share best practices, uh, to share innovation, to share um, you know how they're working through some of these issues, uh, is really uh, demonstrated in in this um, event as well. So I'm pleased to introduce to you today um, the panel that we have before before us. Um, Mara Leff, Mara is there, there she is. Um, Mara serves as the Director of Innovation for the Jewish Healthcare Foundation in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. In her role, she oversees the organization's innovation division and currently leads its latest initiative, Liftoff PGH, a conference in the fall of 2020, an ongoing initiative aimed at elevating Pittsburgh as a hub for healthcare innovation. We also have Ariel Garten. Ariel is a psychotherapist, neuroscientist, mom, former fashion designer, and the female founder and visionary of the tech startup Muse. Muse tracks your brain during meditation to give you real-time feedback on your meditation, guiding you into the zone and solving the problem most of us have when starting a meditation practice. Muse lets you know when you're doing it right. And our third um, panel member today is Jay Lefton. Jay is a partner in the Toronto office of Faskin Martineau Dumoulin, hopefully I said that right. He practices in the areas of corporate and securities law, including public and private financings, mergers and acquisitions, and technology transfer. His clients range from startups to multinationals, and he also advises universities, hospitals, and other academic institutions, as well as inventors and entrepreneurs in connection with the com commercialization of their discoveries. So thank you, panelists, for joining us today. Um, as Mel mentioned earlier, um, this session is really around the commercialization um, and navigating that, um, that journey. Um, when I think about the different uh, startups that we've worked with over the years, um, I often um, think about what it really takes to nurture, almost like, um, and it's almost springtime now, it's so almost like how you're you know, nurturing a garden and how we're bringing those new seedlings to full growth. Um, it's really, I think, both an art and a science. There's, there's elements of that. And I think um, as I've communicated with each of you, um, I've heard some of that in, in what you've shared with me as well. There's so many similarities uh, here. Um, to really helping um, uh, innovation grow, understanding the problems we're seeking to solve, the right amount of uh, dollars that might be needed, um, the right type of expertise and when to bring that expertise, the right time to really hone your focus or to pivot um, if needed, and, um, and when, to really, when you're really ready to grow and really scale. So our, my first question for our panelists is, um, I thought it might be nice for you to just uh, share with us a little bit about your, uh, your journey um, through some of those, um, those different elements. And if you could share with us an example of uh, how you've really brought your expertise to bear against uh, some of these um, key issues. And, um, and I'll open it up first to, um, to Mara, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about and sharing some more about the Virtual Senior Academy that you uh, shared with me earlier. Absolutely. Thank you, Liz. And, and thank you again to everyone for, for having us and for putting this on um, in, in such a, in no time kind of pulling this off. So well done. This is exciting. Um, so I, uh, as, as Liz mentioned, I uh, run an innovation department within a foundation here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We are a healthcare foundation. We're a, what they call a conversion foundation. So we were born out of the sale of a hospital about 30 years ago. Um, and we have, uh, I would say, an overall mandate to improve population health in our region and beyond. And we do that through a variety of different um, strategies. We do a lot of training and coaching. Uh, we do a lot of education, public awareness, and advocacy work. Uh, as Liz mentioned, I run our innovation department, which means that I am looking at the intersection of technology and healthcare um, and how we can use technology and better leverage it to actually improve uh, patient outcomes and population health um, with a, a special focus and passion around uh, aging tech. Um, and so about three years ago, the foundation uh, invested in a, pro a program called the Virtual Senior Academy. It was based on a model that we saw out of New York City um, run by an organization called Self Help. They had developed a, a, a product called the Virtual Senior Center. Uh, we partnered with them and then ended up um, uh, branching off and developing our own product. 
Uh, at its core, the Virtual Senior Academy is aimed to reduce isolation and loneliness among, among older adults through connecting them with uh, online face-to-face -face opportunities for learning and social network building. Um, and so it's, you know, we, we developed it, we invested in it, we seeded in it, we uh, partnered with uh, researchers to, to evaluate it, we, uh, you know, partnered with social service providers and, and other uh, healthcare providers to, to get the word out, to get it into the hands of older adults. And so, you know, it's, some may think a, a foundation might be an unlikely uh, innovation seeder, uh, but we actually think that's really the role of foundations and in philanthropy is to to take an idea, to invest in it, to prove its its validity, uh, to get it out there, and then to really think about scale. and And that's where we are now with the product. Um, is what is the next phase of this? Now that we've sort of proven the concept, we have about a thousand older adults that use it uh, in our region and beyond. And so, what is that next phase? And how can we partner in the community with other folks to commercialize it? Um, so I think that's part of what I'm here to talk talk about. That's good. Great. Thank you. So, thank you so much, Mara. Yeah. Um, Ariel, how would you, um, can you share a little bit about, um, with us and describe your journey? Um, you and I had the opportunity to connect on, on phone a little bit and, and here, and um, thank you for your, um, I think, donating as well the Muse product for the, um, for the event today. So I know many are, are very interested in that. Can, so can you talk a little bit about your journey? Sure. So our journey into healthcare was a little bit unique because we started in consumer first. So we took a clinical grade EEG system and we miniaturized it and turned it into this. So it's, this is actually a clinical grade EEG. And a uh, device in and of itself is actually not that useful. It, does, it doesn't have an application. So the first and most powerful application that we brought it to was to help people meditate. Everybody knows meditation is good for you, but it's hard to do. So we had the ability with EEG to give somebody real-time feedback on their meditation to know when they're focused and when their mind was, wandered. We, was wandering. We knew we were going to have a tremendous impact in healthcare, given the role of meditation to be able to decrease stress and have a big role in pre preventative health. Um, but our route to get there was quite circuitous. We went first to consumer. Um, and there are now over 100,000 consumers that use Muse as a meditation tool on their own, sometimes with the recommendation of a doctor or sometimes because they literally find it in a Facebook ad or a friend of them tells them that they should use it. Um, we then got clinicians on board using Muse in uh, really more private clinic settings like naturopaths, chiropractors, psychotherapists, etc. And then at the same time as we were making revenue through the consumer sales, we were building our efficacy with researchers and hospitals and organizations. So there's now almost 200 papers published using Muse, um, some of them demonstrating some really great outcomes, like a paper from Mayo Clinic that was published last month that showed that individuals using Muse uh, while awaiting surgery for breast cancer were able to reduce the stress of surgery um, and improve their quality of life and fatigue. Um, so we've managed to get into the healthcare space by actually spending a lot of time not in healthcare and not needing to go through the rigors of a healthcare funding round and kind of bootstrapping consumer while building the validation required for healthcare to now go down the FDA path and bring ourselves properly into the healthcare sphere. Really interesting, Ariel. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, and actually, you know, Jay, if I could ask you as you're uh, thinking about what you just heard um, Mara and Ariel um, share, um, and given the, the different organizations that you've worked with over the years, how do you, what kind of advice or how would you, um, how do you think about that journey? Um, and, and specifically, I think um, as Ariel shared, that journey of going down the consumer route first versus you know, uh, navigating the healthcare space, if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. Well, I think the, the, the interesting thing from the uh, legal perspective, and I guess perhaps we can uh, extrapolate and talk about any advisor uh, uh, generally, uh, is that the importance is to be able to uh, provide some guidance, both from the perspective of the uh, of both parties, uh, because uh, as you indicated earlier, uh, through my career, I've acted for institutions, I've acted for large companies, small companies, uh, academics, investors, uh, and I think the important issue is to be able to have a sense uh, of what matters to each, and particularly for earlier stage uh, entrepreneurs uh, who are 
cash strapped uh, and not able to uh, cross every T and dot every I, uh, the important issue is to be able to understand what's important and what isn't, because you're not necessarily at the outset going to be able to create a perfect document, uh, but what you want to do is create an optimal relationship. Uh, so we within our firm have, I guess, one of the few uh, firms in Canada that has uh, an entrepreneur in residence and, and uh, his purpose uh, is to, uh, at no additional cost, uh, advise our earlier stage clients uh, as to the uh, practical pitfalls. It's one thing for a lawyer or other type of advisor uh, to give his or her perspective on what matters and what doesn't matter. Uh, but what we found is having someone who's actually experienced those pitfalls, experienced those challenges, uh, experienced the bumps in the road uh, and made a determination as to how to circumvent them uh, and, and be able to talk to the entrepreneurs uh, in their own language and from their own perspective uh, has been uh, has been very helpful. Mm -hmm. Gosh, that's so interesting. Um, an entrepreneur in residence, how um, is that the person stay the same for a period of time or does that um, person come and go? No, he's actually been with the firm for seven or eight years now. Okay. He's, he's pure and he, he doesn't fill out. His pure uh, purpose uh, is to provide assistance to uh, clients uh, of the firm. He also uh, oversees, uh, we have an early stage uh, uh, program uh, geared towards uh, providing legal services to early stage companies that can't afford uh, the normal uh, 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 legal fee uh, structure uh, and what uh, we have offered, what, what I refer to affectionately as a, a company in a box approach uh, sure. for a relatively fixed fee. Uh, there is both the establishment of the uh, corporation uh, to you know, ass assisting in the creation of templates for, the, for use uh, by the company, uh, as well as a, a certain number of advisory hours uh, per month uh, and per year uh, that, the, uh, that the entrepreneur can simply feel that they can pick up the phone, reach out to someone, and not worry about the fact that the timer is on uh, and, the, and the meeting is on. Yeah, I thank you for sharing that, Jay. Um, and b before we move into the next area, Ariel or Mara, do you have any questions or comments based on what Jay just shared as far as what your experience has been in maybe um, navigating legal um, uh, resources, uh, finding the, the right kinds of, um, how do you find those people? How do you find the people to connect with? Um, can you talk a little bit about that, Mara? I'll ask you first. Yeah, sure. So something that we did um, early on is we submitted the Virtual Senior Academy to a local uh, innovation um, competition. And uh, what, what came with the competition was resources in terms of mentoring, connection with legal and financial uh, advisors. Um, and it, we, we got pretty far along in the, in the process and were a finalist. It was a a social innovation challenge aimed at uh, innovations meant to improve health for vulnerable populations. Um, and so through that experience, I was then connected with sort of the broader uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem here in Pittsburgh, where there are several um, organizations that are dedicated to connecting entrepreneurs with such resource resources. And so until I had sort of broken through that barrier, um, I wasn't exactly sure what was out there. So I used a lot of intermediaries, I think, to find folks that Jay was mentioning, um, you know, incubator groups or accelerator groups that could uh, point me in the right direction. So mm -hmm. sort of the, our entree into, into resources like that. That's great, thank you. Yeah, um, for us, it was the same. We were um, mentored by Mars, who in Toronto was sort of the biggest incubator and was at the time. And they had a relationship with the local law firm, Miller Thompson, who was giving free or reduced hours to startups. So they became our IP and corporate counsel. Um, Anthony DeFazikas, who was our lawyer, moved firms. And now 10 years later, we are still with him. Um, and he's been our IP lawyer the whole time. And he now charges you know, significant rates. But the breaks that he gave us early on as a young startup were really meaningful because we couldn't pay any bills then. Mm -hmm. And so there are, for anybody looking for resources, there are lots of resources that are willing to donate their time to young startups to build the relationship, knowing that if you succeed, they will succeed as well. Yeah, I think that's really uh, critical um, and a, an important point to note. Um, I would agree that the startups that we've worked with and, and the innovation uh, groups that we've interacted with as well, 
um, that that ability to network and and coaching and helping others um, figure out where um, where they can find their resources. Um, sometimes the right questions to ask as well, um, based on where they are on their journey. Um, and then I'm always listening too for um, people who are willing to take good feedback. And um, the, uh, as people are developing their product and, and um, coming to um, some decision points along the way, are they listening to their end users and are they listening to their, uh, their uh, key um, members on their board or their expertise, their, their board, as I say, their, their mental board, sometimes their kitchen cabinet that they've assembled um, and taking in that, you know, that, um, and really listening to the advice that they're getting as well. And I find that many of those startups tend to do better um, because they're open to learning and open to growing. Um, just all, along that point, if I could just add, I, I think that's, that's in my experience has been a, a fundamental uh, shortcoming of many uh, state, early stage startups uh, in terms of uh, understanding what they know and what they don't know. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it's important to, as you say, surround yourself with the, with the proper advisors but also recognize, uh, and I'll be the first one to admit that a lawyer provides a certain type of value, uh, but he or she is not necessarily uh, going to provide the, the, the commercial guidance uh, and, and, the, uh, and the practical guidance. Uh, but I think what, what the lawyer and the other advisors will do is give some advice to the entrepreneur in terms of, of where to seek the, the appropriate level of information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it does take a village, I think, for sure. And thank you for that. Um, Ariel, I want to come back to you and, um, we, um, and talk a little bit about um, funding sources. And um, if you could share a little bit about um, any advice that you might have for uh, considering funding sources. Um, Mara spoke earlier about partnering with a foundation. Um, but can you talk a little bit about what you have found to be the most helpful um, and what the role that the government might play or other sources might play in funding success? Sure. So the funding landscape is better now than it's ever been. Whatever impact coronavirus might have on the economy aside, <laughs> we don't know what that little dip is gonna you know, mm -hmm. turn into. But generally speaking, there's a lot of funding available for early stage startups. Um, there's more seed capital now than there's ever been before. So seed and series A are very easy to get funded. It becomes harder when you move into later stages, the, the, you know, the gap closes. So you really have to perform and you really have to know how to perform and execute. Um, and that's where an incubator can really help. So healthcare is very difficult to navigate and your best bet of succeeding if you either, if you don't have business experience or don't understand sort of how healthcare works is to join a specific healthcare focused incubator and have them guide you through your product creation, have, have them help you build networks and also have them help you find investors because they will have demo days where they bring a number of investors to the table. Um, Government is a tremendously useful support. I know there are people calling in from all over the world, but I can speak specifically to what we have in Canada. Um, the Canadian government has earmarked a significant amount of money for in innovation, and it's really succeeded because the money that they've flown through these innovation pipelines are now actually generating new innovations, new jobs, and increasing our innovation economy. We have programs like uh, OCE, um, NSERC, uh, NSERC runs a program called Engage, um, and Engage allows you to partner with a um, institution and have them do research for you, and they NSERC Engage will pay the institution for you. So we've used Engage significantly. NRC, um, we have large uh, cluster super clusters that you can now apply to for again significant amounts of funding. We have shred credits in Canada so that uh, up to 40% of your innovation dollars spent can be given back to you as a tax credit. Um, and of course there's all the amazing organizations like CABI um, who you know received beautiful funding from the government and floated into multiple projects to seed innovation both at the um, level of you know nurses and workers on the ground, as well as uh, larger organizations and institutions. Um, we received CABI funding for a project that's been really significant in moving us forward. So when you think about funding, everybody's always like, where am I gonna find an angel investor? You know, How's money gonna fall from the sky? And money never falls from the sky. But if you're diligent, you can go online, you can look up the local resources, you can reach out to you know, granting bodies, call and speak to somebody because they all have somebody you can speak to. 
um, you know, find out the deadlines for application and be diligent about applying. On the VC side, um, we initially had more traditional VC investment. So although we're pivoting into healthcare and have kind of been in healthcare all along, um, we don't actually have any healthcare investors. We have some, but a very, very small percentage relative to the other investors we have. And that's actually becoming more of a trend. In the past, if you were in healthcare, you would go to a dedicated life sciences investor, there's very specific metrics they would need to see. Um, the check sizes would be significant because the cost of clinical trials is so high. Um, you know, FDA is the would be the only question that everybody focused on. And now because we have, you know, models in digital health that are starting to shift and move, um, and we have a lot of consumer health tools, a lot of the VCs are wanting to get into healthcare or have a healthcare strategy but without being a life science investor. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing more flexible ways that VC and equity funding is flowing into healthcare companies as well. Mm -hmm. And I would say, ahead, uh, yeah, so in Pittsburgh, we, we have um, sort of a, not a huge, huge amount of, of funders that are doing what exactly what you just said. However, there's been interesting um, action right now where there is a group of angel investors that are really looking to get into the life sciences space that have typically not funded. And there are some efforts I know um, regionally to help connect folks with those sort of investments. And so I, I'm seeing a trend shifting in our region, at least um, investors starting to look more towards those types of products and um, opportunities. So um, it's interesting to hear what's happening in Canada yeah, and in San Francisco, so, you know, the big San Francisco firms like Andreessen Horowitz, et cetera, they all have a dedicated healthcare section. So people who have been traditionally tech VCs have, yeah. you know, over the last five years, opened healthcare focused arms to make healthcare investments. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's going in the right direction, I think. Mm -hmm. When it comes to... Sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Jay. No, I was going to say, when it comes to financing, I, I agree with Ariel that it's really a matter of examining uh, the complete uh, landscape and, and looking at the at the options, but I think the one uh, point that I would always counsel an entrepreneur to do is, is plan ahead uh, and and look uh, play a bit of a chess game uh, and look several moves uh, down down the road. Uh, anticipate where your options are going to be coming from uh, and make sure not to paint yourself into a corner. I was uh, experiencing situation where a few years ago, a major uh, US law firm uh, had counseled a, uh, some entrepreneurs who uh, had been uh, studying uh, at, uh, at Stanford uh, in terms of uh, structuring uh, their company going forward. And they did what, as a knee-jerk reaction, most US investors uh, in, in US companies would do, and that is uh, incorporate a Delaware-based corporation. Uh, the challenge with that is that the law firm didn't ask the question, what are you planning on doing when you finish your PhD? And as it turned out, those people were coming back to Canada. They came back to Canada and they found out that, that an Ariel, Ariel rather, uh, referred to shred credits. Uh, and you know, that, that, that's a, an acronym for scientific research and experimental development. And that's a, a government, federal government incentive in Canada, which both is a, a significant tax credit uh, regime uh, which is available to virtually every corporation, but more importantly, uh, it's a uh, it's a tax refund regime for what are referred to as CCPC, Canadian Controlled Private Corporations. Uh, and a Delaware corporation, even if it is controlled by Canadians, does not constitute a CCPC. Uh, and therefore, we had to spend a, an exorbitant amount of time restructuring the corporation, getting the IP out of the United States and into Canada in order to be able to take advantage of the, uh, of the shred, uh, shred availability. So I think it's important to know if it turns, and having said that, it, it equally could be that if all of the potential angel investors and VC investors are uh, in the United States and have no interest in investing in a Canadian corporation, then you'd be making a mistake uh, to incorporate in Canada. So I think you need to simply look at all of the, uh, the potential uh, opportunities and the options that, that are presented to you but equally recognize that not all money is, is created equal uh, when you're looking at a source of funding, uh, unless it is completely passive, uh, then you want to be able to have an understanding of what kind of relationship uh, those sources of funding have had uh, with prior investee companies. Are they hands-on, are they hands-off? 
Are they aggressive? Uh, do they second guess management uh, at, at every step? Uh, or do they, uh, do they support management uh, in, in proceeding? Uh, having said that, I also recognize that it's important uh, that, that, you, that there may be some investors uh, who you want to be able to uh, have on a, on a hands-on basis. You may, it's not, uh, while some uh, entrepreneurs believe a hands-off approach is preferable, uh, having the right strategic investor uh, who has experience in your sector, in your space, who can bring that guidance to bear uh, is fairly instrumental. Wow, I, as I'm listening to all of you speak about um, you know these issues, and I and I'm just thinking, wouldn't it be great if um, there was a, just a one place that every new innovator could go? And then I'm thinking to myself, oh wait, they can go to Cabby and they can find a lot of this resource here through Cabby. And so, um, excellent uh, insight, excellent um, thing and and guidance. Thank you. Um, I have been informed by our fearless leader, Mel Barsky, that we've got a question from the audience. And so um, we are at about, we've got about five minutes left of our time. So I do wanna make sure that we have time to take uh, any questions. So Mel, I'm gonna turn it over to you if you could please ask the question. Um, and we will, um, and then the panelists will ju we'll just decide who's the right person to, to respond. Uh, thanks, Liz. Um, the first one, I think, actually, it's going to be most directed at Jay, but anybody's welcome to chirp in. Um, speak, could you please speak more to the importance of intellectual property? At what stages is it important to get IP protection? Example, for scientists at universities who are thinking about entrepreneurship. Jay, a little patent protection? Yeah, th thanks very much, Mel. Uh, so I, I think the short answer is that it's, it's important at all stages. Uh, and let me just parse that a little bit. Uh, from the point of view of an academic investor, uh, sorry, academic researcher rather, uh, the, the first stage is to understand the invention's ownership policy of the institution at which he or she uh, is conducting the research. There are some institutions in the world that have an inventor-owned policy. If I create something, I own it. Uh, and there are other institutions that have an institution-owned policy. If I am on faculty and using resources uh, uh, at, the, at the university, at the hospital, uh, then I have no ownership interest in that intellectual property, uh, but rather uh, that I have a, a, a potential indirect ec economic interest, but my institution actually owns it uh, and can determine uh, how uh, and in what manner and on what terms and conditions uh, that, can be, uh, uh, that can be commercialized. Uh, once the uh, IP gets out of the institution and into the hands of a startup company, uh, what's important always is to maintain a what I refer to as a chain of title, uh, that you're always able to point to every piece of intellectual property that's been created uh, and have a document which says it has been assigned to the corporation. And whether you have employees, consultants, founders, uh, you know, it's important to make sure that there's a piece of paper uh, which says I've created this and it belongs to you, uh, a startup co. Uh, because I've, I've found many cases where uh, sloppy housekeeping uh, has resulted in uh, M&A transactions or licensing transactions that have fallen apart uh, because on closer examination, uh, the company doesn't own or have rights to what it thought it had rights to. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I'm going to answer quickly. So uh, IP is incredibly important if you're looking to be funded or have somebody acquire you. Um, there are companies that have not been able to move forward because they've created an, an innovation and somebody else actually holds the patent on it and the person's willing to prosecute and so they can't move forward. For us, we started patenting early on and we now have 95 patent filings, including some incredibly early priority filings in the space overall. So it's very expensive to do. We've spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars doing it. Uh, the best way is early on to file provisional patents because then you get a little bit of time to play with your patent and see where your innovation uh, moves to while you still have a stake in the ground saying, you know, I came up with this innovation on this date. Just to follow up on that point, I think it's also important for the entrepreneurs to do uh, what may be topical discussion now, to do some spring cleaning periodically uh, to review your patent portfolio and determine what continues to be relevant uh, and what doesn't. Uh, and you know, oftentimes the entrepreneur is more focused on advancing the business. Uh, and you know, once the IP is in the attic, uh, then we just uh, let it gather dust. Uh, but as, as Ariel indicated, uh, they can be very expensive to maintain. And to the extent that you can cut some loose and feel that it's no longer relevant, 
it's, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's certainly a, a cost saving measure that manual delivery is really simply uh, considering one of the variables. Yeah, excellent. Um, thank you so much. Um, wow, again, just great insights from all of you. Um, we've got about a minute left, and um, and I thought maybe uh, I would ask each of you if you could just share one or two words of advice um, or a final thought uh, with our attendees today that you'd like them to remember as they embark on this uh, this journey. Ariel, can we start with you? Sure. So this may all sound complicated and like there's so much to do, but don't keep that from actually starting. You know, when I began the company, I didn't have experience in healthcare or marketing or manufacturing or FDA or any of the complexities of a business. Um, I began and I was able to acquire the talent that I needed, you know, engage people who understood it better than I did, bring them on board the team and move forward and tackle each of these complexities. And that's what allowed this innovation to come to market. And innovation can come from anywhere, whether you have a business background or a science background, it doesn't really matter so long as you partner with the people who can fill in your gaps and holes. So although this sounds like a lot, don't let it be intimidating. There are lots of great resources like CABI or in Toronto, the Biomedical Zone or um, you know, incubators in your own hometowns who can help guide you through this. Great, thank you. Mara? I would just say, you know, look for partners in unlikely places and to get out into the community and really get to know the local ecosystem and the various resources that are available. Um, and, and to not be afraid to, you know, submit to a competition or, you know, put, you know, put your, your hat in the ring. Um, you know, cause I, I agree, a, a, an innovative idea can come from anywhere. Um, and so I think there are lots of resources, uh, available. It's just sometimes a matter of going out and, and looking for them. So. Good. Thank you. And Jay. Uh, I guess the probably three uh, distinct takeaways that I would recommend. The first is a, to, to recall and remember that the, uh, a patent uh, is only available to the extent that the concept is, is a novel concept. And what that means is that if you publicly disclosed it, whether at a conference uh, or, uh, or otherwise with a paper on it, uh, that will effectively uh, uh, prohibit you from achieving uh, the uh, patentability of your invention. So it's important to, to maintain the confidentiality of it uh, and not make it publicly available. Uh, a second issue, uh, which is perhaps obvious or perhaps not so obvious, uh, as you embark upon your journey uh, to make sure to speak with an appropriate tax advisor, uh, either from the perspective of uh, the company or from your own perspective to make sure that you're uh, structuring your affairs in the most tax optimal manner. In Canada, we have What's referred to as super capital gains exemption, uh, and uh, that's only that's available per person. So uh, there may be uh, reasons why you would not necessarily want to hold all of your shares in your own name. You may want to hold them in your spouse's name, in your children's name, in your parents' name, or perhaps establish a family trust. And the last point I think is to uh, think about when you're embarking upon the establishment of the company, uh, who are the founders? Uh, and you know, I, I see a founder as someone who's taking an active role in the decision making. Uh, many people think of a founder as the people who have equity at the outset. And it may well be that you may have a, an employee who has equity, but that employee doesn't necessarily uh, have decision making authority. Uh, and at, at one point in time, when it's important to make a decision, you don't wanna to have too many people uh, uh, around the kitchen table uh, arguing about what the direction is going to be. Uh, ultimately, okay. you need to make sure that you have an understanding of what, uh, who, who has what responsibilities and, and equally to anticipate, and I've seen a lot of relationships fall apart because they have anticipated the, the relationship between the founders. What happens if one of the founders uh, who starts off with equity of 20% uh, dies the next day, uh, decides uh, two months later that he or she is gonna go off to another country uh, to, to study uh, or simply go into a competing business. Do they get to keep their equity? Do they lose it? Is there some kind of vesting? But I think the important issue is to make sure that everyone's clear on what the relationship between the parties is, because that's, uh, that's fairly fundamental. Uh, and I, I always believe that it's important to recognize the terms of the relationship uh, and, and embody those in an agreement and hopefully uh, put that agreement away in a drawer and never look at it again. Uh, but it, it's in some respects like a prenup. Uh, you want to make sure that everyone understands their respective responsibilities 
uh, and limitations uh, when they go into the relationship. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, Mel, as I listened to our panelists today, I, I was struck by the thought that we could have a whole conference just around this topic um, and, and continue to, to dig deeper into each of these um, different points. So I'd like to thank our panelists today. Mel, I'll turn it back over to you and the team. Uh, thank you all so much for, for joining us and thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to be on the panel and be a part of this cool virtual reality conference. Um, and so excited that um, we had the opportunity still to be able to learn from each other today um, in spite of the, the travel restrictions and the, the challenges that we're, we're currently facing. So I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Liz, Ariel, Mero, Jay. I appreciate everybody attending virtually. The Center for Aging and Brain Health Innovation is powered by Baycrest. To listen in and get involved, go to cabhi.com. The podcast technicians behind the scenes are Podtex. Share your What's Next Canada podcast ideas with us at www.podtext.com. P O D T E C H S. Podtext, your partners in podcasting.